This month, let's take on the question, why am I here? We know the physiological reason, of course, but we suspect there's another, more important reason, too. As someone has written, if the universe is an accident, we're accidents. But if there is meaning in the universe, there's meaning in us also. Perhaps Dr. Albert Einstein helped us understand more about the laws governing the universe than any man who ever lived, and he believed there was some sort of meaning in the way things are. He was sure of it. He said, the more I study physics, the more I'm drawn toward metaphysics. If you haven't done so, you would enjoy reading Einstein, His Life and Times by Ronald W. Clark. Albert Einstein was so remarkable a man, it was as though he'd arrived at this planet through some mistake in celestial navigation, and as a result devoted his life to solving the problems of time and space so that the mistake would not be repeated. Although he belonged to no formal religion or sect, he was a deeply religious man in the cosmic sense. He believed that such magnificence and colossal order, the great cyclotron of the universe, as Ronald Clark puts it, could not have been an accident. But Einstein was much more than a giant in physics. He was a courageous and gentle humanitarian as well, and he addressed himself to the purpose of life. And he answered the question, Why am I here? as well as it has been answered, I believe, when he said, Man is here for the sake of other men only. Now that's about it. I'll buy that. Man is here to serve man only. It's the only reason in my mind that makes sense. There may be millions who don't agree and millions more who are unacquainted with that statement, but the truth of it will be reflected in their lives regardless. The truth of that great statement is reflected in your life and mine also. Even the fun we seek is dependent upon it. If we do not serve others, life becomes meaningless to us. And this is behind much of the unrest we find in today's youth, I believe. There's something in each of us that tells us, once we've put away the things of childhood, that we're here to serve others. And if we remain in positions in which we are not assuming the service that normally should go with adulthood, we become restive, anxious, and depressed. It's behind much of the unease common to men on a Sunday afternoon or evening. It's why we get tired after a while of playing golf every day or fishing or sailing or whatever leisure activity we engage in. We might say that our leisure has meaning and renewal to the extent that we know we've earned it, and we earn it by serving others, especially in our culture. We have only to look at those who do not serve to see the truth of our postulate. There's the dissatisfaction of our older student population. The people on Skid Row seeking escape in alcohol, in prison seeking escape in any way they can find it, in the unemployed, and even in the tragic idle rich and members of the jet set whose lives, if they have not found some meaningful form of expression, or a cause or role in which they can lose themselves, are pitiful caricatures of real existence. Those who have not found themselves quite often try to lose themselves. Now, in an earlier direct line, we mentioned Dr. Maslow's comment that people are judged in our society in the same way fruit trees are judged, by their fruit, by their production, its quality and quantity, which is another way of saying by how well they serve. A young person often asks, why am I here? The answer is, you are here to serve. Your part of the bargain is to so marshal your unique resources as to do the best possible job of serving others, and you will always serve best doing that which you most enjoy, that which best fits your unique talents and abilities. The next question usually goes, well, that's all fine, but what do I get out of it? And the answer to that, of course, goes your rewards all the years of your life will match the extent and quality of your service. Now, if you happen to want a $3,000 a week income or enjoy flying your own jet and driving expensive cars, you've got to serve in an uncommon way. Now, how you do it is for you to solve, and this is the challenge that can make life so interesting, so exasperating and baffling. We have to make up our minds as to what's important to us. Now, Dr. Einstein wanted nothing more than the simple necessities of life, a roof, a bed, food, a place to work, his violin, and his sailboat. The modern trappings of success meant nothing to him. He was simply above them. He was often mistaken for an unsuccessful traveling salesman. But his service to mankind was monumental, and his reward? Immortality. He could have had anything of a material nature he wanted. He wanted nothing. He was a completely mature human being. 
But he had not selected his own great gifts. His abilities, like ours, had come as his unique genetic heritage. He simply put them to the best use he could, while at the same time developing a mature and rich overview of mankind. I think we should do the same, and that our kids should know, when they're old enough to know, that they should do the same, make the best use of their gifts, and by so doing, maximize their service, and by so doing, maximize their rewards. It all fits. It makes sense whether you're interested in giving, getting, or both. Few of us have matured or become so wrapped up in one subject to the degree reached by Dr. Einstein. Most of us are much concerned with this world and how we can enjoy it as we go along. We tend to like beautiful things and the perquisites of success. Perhaps we're still children to that extent, but it's fun being a child and harmless. We seem to like such things as beautiful homes, cars, furs, jewels, yachts, and travel, at least until after we've had them for a while. But forgetting for the moment what we may want, the important thing is to find how we can best serve. It answers the question, why am I here? I am here to serve others. Now I know why I get up in the morning and what I should spend a good proportion of my day doing maximizing, if I can, my service to those I have chosen to serve. How can I do a better job of serving today than I did yesterday, this year than last? As long as I can keep answering that question, I will continue to grow and mature as a person, and I'll never grow old in mind and spirit. It clarifies our lives. As Voltaire's Candide said, Let us cultivate our garden. Let's make it a good garden the best garden we can produce with the equipment and conditions we've been given within the enormous parameters offered by the world of today and tomorrow. But how do we relate the idea of service to others with our personal goals? In his excellent book, A God Within, the distinguished microbiologist and author René Dubot tells us that the pre-classical and classical Greeks symbolized the hidden aspects of man's nature, in particular the forces that motivate him to perform memorable deeds, by the word entheos, a God within. From the Greek word entheos is derived the word enthusiasm, one of the most beautiful words in any language. And he adds, Man today may no longer believe in the divine origin of inspiration, but there are few who do not retain the ancient and almost mystical faith that enthusiasm is the source of creativity. Whatever their religious or philosophical allegiance, all men and women know that there would be little chance of improving the world if it were not for the faith derived from the God within. In the original Greek sense, the word enthusiasm means far more than deep interest, ardent zeal, or twinkling eyes. It implies the divine madness, the mania that Socrates regarded as the mainspring of all worthwhile creations. As Plato worded it in Phaedrus, in reality the greatest of blessings come to us through madness, when it is sent as a gift of the gods. Madness, which comes from God, is superior to sanity, which is of human origin. I think that's what each of us is looking for, the kind of work that so fits the kind of person we are that we can lose ourselves in it and find endless enthusiasm, a kind of divine madness. When we do, our daily efforts become one with our goals or with our role. We then serve automatically. Service becomes a natural concomitant, a byproduct of our daily thinking, creativity, and actions. There's little doubt that creativity is a natural extension of enthusiasm. And I'm convinced that there is a kind of work for each of us which will bring the God within us to the surface. Enthusiasm is a kind of madness or mania, and is, as Socrates thought, the mainspring of all worthwhile creations. Our personal goals, then, become almost incidental and automatically come to us, and we're given what we need, whatever it is that we need, in order to continue our work. That might involve a great corporation employing thousands of people. It might involve a particular job or position, an entirely new entity of some kind, such as an organization or corporation or small business enterprise. It might involve a, an avocation or spare time activity, a retirement interest. But lurking within every single one of us, such a source of enthusiasm exists. Our own entheos, our own God within. It's interesting that when we find our own God within, it will quite often be a source not only of deep personal satisfaction, enthusiasm, and creativity, but of sufficient financial reward as well. In our world of today, money is usually the way we keep score. The best players, those who have found their greater source of talent, application, enthusiasm, and creativity, usually wind up with a satisfactory share of the world's marbles. 
In Charles Frankel's excellent book, The Pleasures of Philosophy, we learn that when Plato speaks of good or virtuous men, as he repeatedly does in the Symposium and other dialogues, it's useful to bear in mind what the Greeks meant by such terms. They didn't hold a Sunday school view of morality. Frederick Woolbridge, who was a colleague of John Dewey's at Columbia for many years, used to remark that the history of morals was told in the history of the word virtue. It began with the Greeks by meaning strength in a man, and it had come among the Victorians to mean weakness in a woman. The model of the good or virtuous man whom the Greeks had in mind was a gentleman, gregarious by nature and active in public life. He loved words and argument. He was sensitive to beauty and should, the Greeks thought, be physically attractive himself. There was a touch of magnificence in his bearing and a love of color. He was magnanimous with others, liberal, though not ostentatious with money, and indifferent to hardship if it was forced upon him. But he was not meek or humble. He sought to be fair and just in his dealings and prudent and temperate in his conduct, but he admired talent, strength, and accomplishment and he saw no virtue in poverty and no higher wisdom in simpleness of mind. Most conspicuously missing from this calendar of virtues is one quality which we rank high today, pity for weakness. It sounds like a description of the hero in one of Ayn Rand's books, but it's a good description, I think, of the person with an excellent self-image, a person who knows what he wants and how to set about getting it. And I think it's an apt description, too, of the people who do things in the world. You will greatly enjoy reading The Pleasures of Philosophy by Professor Charles Frankel, the former Assistant Secretary of State for Educational and Cultural Affairs, a fine author to add to your personal collection. We are all looking for what is good and beautiful, as Socrates suggested we do, and we'll be on the road to it when we find that which is good and beautiful within ourselves. There's something within each of us telling or trying to tell us the way to find it. And it will, I believe, invariably lead to service. It can be done through a good product, whatever shape it might take. It might be a book, such as those we've discussed here, or a novel, or a product for use by people, or a service of some kind. And it's here that we should keep what is important and what isn't ever before us. It's an easy thing to lose sight of. If we're managers in business, we tend to become obsessed, and for several very good reasons, with that bottom line of the financial statement. A profit must be the answer, the logical answer to the right kind of product or service. If what we do has no market value, it's unlikely that it's really good or necessary, or desired on the part of people. And we need profit if we're to grow, to invest back into our business, and pay those who have invested in it. But sometimes the machines we've created take charge of us. They say, look, we can produce in great abundance, turn us loose, and we run the risk of losing sight of quality and service and meaning in our admiration for limitless quantity. Popularity itself can become the enemy of quality. Great as mass production techniques have become, we should not let them attain a speed or aim that sacrifices quality and legitimate purpose to quantity. It's better to have a market larger than our ability to fill it, to have a waiting line if necessary, to hold back on maximum profits if necessary, to make sure that what we're producing, the way in which we're serving those whom we've chosen to serve, is the very best way of which we're capable. Once the type has been set for a book, millions of perfect quality can be printed and distributed, and that's also true of many other kinds of products. But in the writing of that book, in the designing and formulation of the original product, the time needs to be taken, the care, the enthusiasm, the creativity, the sense of responsibility, all should be in. And the controlling idea should be, how good can we do it, not how much money can we make on it. If we put things in this order, and if we know what we're doing, the money should come as a natural effect. Then we're creating instead of merely competing. Then we're leading instead of following. I'd like to quote from Manus for September 20th, 1972. Pain is nothing new in the world. The chronicles of history are filled with accounts of human suffering. Great migrations of peoples have often been efforts to escape from conditions where pain was inevitable. But today a new kind of pain has been added to the human lot the pain of bewildered and frustrated understanding. Whether justifiably or not, men thought they were on the verge of having enough knowledge to understand the world and the place of human beings in it, yet are now confronted by increasing evidence that their knowledge is either false or woefully insufficient. 
The years which ought to have witnessed the climactic success of Western society are beginning to seem like brief intervals of rising desperation. Not the next triumph, but the next disaster becomes the content of wandering minds. So there is the pain felt by men whose intelligence grows ineffectual, whose wealth no longer purchases anything worth having, whose dreams no longer relate to the possibilities disclosed by the stern imperatives of nature. There's a spreading feeling that we ought to know who we are, what the world is about, and what we should be doing, since we know so many other things so well. But in answering these larger questions, we uniformly fail. Inevitably, then, an intellectual pain underlain by vague moral guilt pervades the serious men of the times, who feel as though they stand at some great crossroads of history, but where the alternative paths into the future seem both untraveled and unmarked. It is, we may say, a philosophic pain, and hence may be called a birth pain, signifying the time and necessity for entry into another kind of life. But philosophic pain is not new either. What is new is the fact that it seems to be overtaking an entire age and culture, while in the past it sought out only rare individuals, afflicting them with questions in which the world at large had no interest at all. The philosophic quest was once for the lonely few, and those who accepted its austere invitation had lost their taste for other inquiries. They responded by reason of some hidden hunger or longing. What made Socrates resolve to spend his life helping men to undeceive themselves? We don't know. Many of his fellow Athenians thought him ridiculous, and finally a troublesome fellow the city could well do without. It's a curious thing, this, that the world savors the teachings of a Socrates, keeping his ideas alive for thousands of years. Yet when a living man practices the Socratic calling, his countrymen find ways of isolating him and denying attention to his ideas. For what it's worth, we have a theory about the present. It is that the circumstances of life, as men have altered and shaped them, are now setting the Socratic questions. What was the purpose of the Socratic questions? The old Athenian hoped to persuade the Greeks to look at their own beliefs, their own first principles, and to see if they were good enough to live by, a painful question for almost any man. Socrates was a gentle and kindly fellow, and he did his best to put his questions in comprehensible terms. Not so the angry circumstances of our lives. All that they say to us is, It won't work. What you're doing is not the right thing to do. A hurt, humiliated, and mistreated nature speaks to us through the responses of the environment, in the outcries of angry men, and in the revolts of the young. And the voice of nature is not the amiable speech of Socrates, who strove to make his listeners understand. No, the voice of nature in speaking to us is as indifferent to our anxious intelligence as we have been to the world around us during the centuries in which we harnessed its energies and wasted its riches in the service of our interests and appetites. Nature is now a cold and inflexible instructor. We have perhaps but one advantage in hearing the voice of the environment instead of mild Socratic counsels. Our ill-used host now speaks to everyone, not just to a handful of would-be philosophers. Ready or not, we must now begin to understand its admonitions or suffer almost immediate consequences for our continuing ignorance. In literature and Western man, a valuable cultural study as well as a history of literature, J. B. Priestley speaks of the change which came over Western civilization as a result of the Industrial Revolution and the development of volume printing from a continuous roll of paper. The big expansion of industrialism began a little over a century ago. Power to a new middle class, largely indifferent to thought and literature. As Priestley puts it, this age, with all that it accomplished in material progress, represents the triumph of the manufacturing and commercial middle class. The world of Victorian and Imperial Britain, of the North after the American Civil War, of the French Second Empire, even, though to a lesser extent, of Russia after 1861 and the freeing of the serfs, is the world as this particular class, which has more power and thrust than any other, desires and makes it. The great international exhibitions from 1851 onwards reflect the whole glittering triumph of these busy, acquisitive people. They control the powerhouse of all Western society. They shape and color the social scene. The values that society takes for granted are not their values. Now, while this passage by no means explains why the 
populations of England and America so easily submitted to the credo of these busy, acquisitive people. It records the fact of commercial dominance and enables us to understand why the gross national product has until very recently been regarded as the principal measure of human achievement. Now, from these psychological foundations, the rape of the planet proceeded as a matter of course. There were, however, other factors, such as the union of scientific technology with industry, which occurred, according to Lynn White, Jr., about 1850, enormously accelerating the destructive course of industrial expansion. And, as Dr. White adds in an epoch-making paper, with the population explosion, the carcinoma of planless urbanism, the now geological deposits of sewage and garbage, surely no creature other than man has ever managed to foul its nest in such short order. Western man, Dr. White says, has no concern or regard for the earth and its creatures. He merely uses them for his own purposes, and he believes that we shall find no remedy for our multiplying planetary ills save by an essentially religious change in attitude. We must rethink and refeel our nature and destiny. Another Socratic apprentice, very nearly a journeyman, is the economist E. F. Schumacher, whose campaign for intermediate technology is slowly taking hold. Mr. Schumacher's economic gospel has two planks. First, he believes in the simple life and regards economics as a discipline which should subordinate to the order and needs of a life guided by moral intelligence. The least possible consumption consistent with decency and health is his idea of the way for human beings to live. His second theme is concerned with how help should be given to the undeveloped peoples of the world. And this is where intermediate technology comes in. Bringing the sophisticated tools and systems of advanced technology to cultures which are not widely industrialized amounts to locking the people of these countries out of the process of natural development. They need simple tools, intermediate technology, not the complicated devices which are the evolution of a capital-intensive labor-scarce society. The requirements of the underdeveloped countries, so-called, have plenty of labor, people who need work, they do not need machines which displace men, but well-designed tools that will enable the people to work more efficiently. Only by this means can they become self-reliant, gaining the confidence to develop in their own way. Now, Ivan Illich's contentions have much in common with E.F. Schumacher's ideas. Like Schumacher, Illich is interested in the development or provision of tools which strengthen the individual instead of weakening him or making him feel incompetent and dependent. For Illich, the means of education are a kind of tool, easily available. The purpose of education should be to free the students from external, not imprison them low in hierarchical structures, where rising to a higher level becomes virtually impossible because of the inaccessibility of the tools of learning, which have been made scarce by high cost and by professionalism. Technology should free and release men not condemn them to lives of servitude because complicated systems inevitably create inferiority and subordination. Illich's analysis of consumerism and the claims to exclusive knowledge by experts shows that radical political solutions do not touch the real problems of modern man, which result from the dehumanizing effects of the very methods and techniques which are supposed to bring freedom and prosperity to all. Illich argues that the always more doctrine of Western industrialism is self-defeating, and that in practice it operates to make common folk dependent and unable to plan and live their own lives. What have Schumacher and Illich in common? Well, they agree on one thing. The awakening of the potentialities of human beings is the most important thing in life. The awakening of the potentialities of human beings is the most important thing in life. They will agree with John Ruskin that the test of a social system is not what wealth it is producing, but what kind of men, what kind of human experience is it producing. The gross mistakes of our society, the pollution, the wars, the indifference to the young, the old, the sick, the maladjusted, are obvious enough and much written about. But the core ill lies in what man thinks of man. Neither Schumacher nor Illich is willing to license anyone to manipulate other human beings into better conditions. The elements of human improvement are already within each one. What all need is an environment which invites to self-development.